morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to the Hartford Institute for the invitation to speak to you today. William Hogarth was an outstanding 18th century English artist, printmaker, and social commentator. He would, uh, he would be welcome with us today for his comments on the IPCC. On the right here, you see his interpretation uh, of the fundamentalist religious meetings of the day. And the minister in the pulpit is threatening the congregation with a witch in one hand and the devil in the other, which might of course be the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the acidification of the ocean. The congregation is reacting in the way that uh, humans on mass do. They are various states of hysteria and swooning. And the lady in the bottom left corner here is giving birth to rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually modelled on a known historic character in London at the time. And in the bottom right, probably most significant of all on a scale, is a diseased brain. Now, in this entire picture, there's one same person. And that person is outside, smoking a pipe, looking through the window, somewhat bemused at what is going on. For the remainder of this talk, that person is you and me. <laughs> this is the sort of fundamentalist uh, things we're reading in the newspaper. Every credible piece of scientific evidence we now have, including that of Australia's peak scientific body, this, the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial and Research Organization tells us that climate change is accelerating faster than previously feared. Now that was written by one James Norman, and I know no more about Mr. Norman than he is a reporter, and he's used the words science twice, scientific advice and scientific body. That immediately leads me to go to the bookshelf and pull down the dictionary and look up the word science. And when I do that, this is what I find, that the first definition is the state or fact of knowing. You think about that for a moment, that's a sort of state of grace. And it's a state of grace that certainly Al Gore and the IPCC and Mr. Norman and the CSIRO think they inhabit. But most of us don't use that meaning of science, albeit it's technically valid. Most of us use a definition of science which goes more like this. It's a branch of study which is connected uh, either with a connected body of demonstrated truths or with observed facts which are systematically classified and more or less colligated, wonderful word, you only find words like that in the Optical English Dictionary, uh, colligated uh, by being brought under general laws. There's no general law for climate change, and that is one of the problems why you can't just play it into a computer model and get an answer that means it. Finally, and most importantly of this definition, is the and which. And which includes trustworthy methods for the discovery of new truth. Now, what are those trustworthy methods? And the answer, of course, is the time-honored observations and experiments, so-called empirical science, and we don't do that just for the fun of it. We do that because we wish to test our hypothesis. The hypothesis of the day is that human caused carbon dioxide emissions are causing dangerous global warming. That is normally put to me and to the other people who are used to this at this meeting by newspaper reporters as, is global warming happening? <laughs> and this piece of sloppy terminology is one that irritates me intensely because it's code for is human caused carbon dioxide emissions or are they causing dangerous global warming? That is the hypothesis. And I'm going to test it in five ways. Here's the first. Has global temperature warmed over the last few years? Now, I'm not unknown for saying in public that it hasn't, and I've already been admonished publicly by several of the speakers at this meeting for making such a dramatic statement. However, I'm a scientist, and I like to deal in facts. 
The fact is, and these are the data from the Climate Research Unit, the Hadley Center in Britain, these are the temperature data that the IPCC uses, and the fact is that since 1998 and 2005, there is no trend, either up or down. The fact is that the temperature has not increased over that period of time. We can discuss all night over a whiskey the significance or the interpretation of that fact. But the fact is, for the last nine years now, seven of which are shown here, there's been no increase in global temperature. However, over the same period of time, there's been a 4% increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. What was the hypothesis? The hypothesis was that if you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere extra, it will cause global warming. This is test number one of the hypothesis, and it fails. Well, Bob, it's already been said, you're just talking about the last seven or eight years. Only a fool would predict long-term climate on that. Indeed, I'm not predicting long-term climate. I'm testing a hypothesis. And here it is. This is the little box we just looked at from 2000 to 2005 or so. And of course, that followed this ramp here from 1970 through to 1998, when temperature did increase as plotted by this graph. What is the temperature plotted here? It's the ground temperature from the thermometers, or these days the electronic sensors, in the little white steams and boxes. We've already heard most eloquently in at least two talks why that apparent warming trend is almost certainly spurious. Let's look at the best available data we have, the microwave sensing unit satellite data. From 1979 through to 2005, the southern hemisphere, flat as a tack, no warming whatsoever. The northern hemisphere, a very slight warming, and when you average it out globally, an even slighter warming. So, not only for the last nine years has there been no significant warning, but against the best database that we have, in reality, against the last uh, 25 or so years, there has not been global warming, because global warming means both north and southern hemisphere. The planet doesn't know, if you're looking at it from space and measuring it spectroscopically, uh, about this. We used to measure one number, but we're on the planet, we've measured two numbers. It's not warming in the southern hemisphere, and indeed it's only warmed a very small amount overall against the best data uh, over that period of time. And here's the latest plot from the two different satellite groups uh, of, of that climate uh, um, research unit data I plotted up. Uh, out to 2008. Here's the recent dive away, and you'll see that's a continuation, in fact, of a declining trend now that's been going on uh, actually since 2005. So we are three years into a declining trend. Again, we can argue about whether you think that's a period of time that's significant in climatic terms, but you can't argue about the trend itself. So test number one, then, a requirement of our hypothesis is that if dangerous temperature rises occurring, then temperature rise should be well, it's not. The second test we will apply is if we're going to have dangerous global warming, we have to show that it lies outside the previous range of natural variation. And again, we've already heard uh, a paper earlier from Craig on this, which does it much more detail than I'm going to do. Uh, we all know about the hockey stick. The problem with the hockey stick is it's a statistical contrivance. It takes many, many uh, different uh, tree ring data sets, mainly, and combines them into one curve. I'm just going to take a recent uh, paper uh, with one uh, set of tree ring data from northern Scandinavia. And we have here 500 AD, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. So it's the last 1,500 years. And here's the uh, moving average of the temperature plot. And what we see is that we can recognize the little ice age, this cooler period in here generally. We can recognize Craig's medieval warm period here. And the 10 red dots are times in the last 1,500 years when the temperature in northern Scandinavia has been higher than it is today. Well, tree rings, they've got their problems. So let's move to another sort of paleo data. This is a recent paper by Craig Lurl, who's speaking later today, and Houston Cullock, 
and they now go from uh, uh, birth of Christ, from zero through to 2000, so this is now the last 2000 years, uh, and they uh, take a number of proxies which include ice cores, uh, lake cores, sea cores, uh, speleothems from caves, and they come up with a, a plot which, again, we can recognize clearly a medieval warm period, a little ice age, and a, a late 20th century warming, and this is less than that. So our second test then, uh, uh, as to whether modern temperature is in any way unusually warm or increasing at an unusually high rate, again, the answer is no. Extending that test a little further, and looking now at 5,000 years of data, rather than just the uh, 1,500 or 2,000, uh, we're now looking at the ice core from Greenland, and we go back to the birth of Christ here, 2,000 years, and back to, uh, to 3,000 years BC. We've just looked in the little box here. Here's the little ice age, here's the medieval warm period, it gets a, a, a green stripe. Uh, the modern warm period gets a green stripe, and so do the earlier warm periods with a periodicity of around 1,500 years. This is the solar cycle that has recently been covered by Dennis Avery and Fred Singer in their book. It's very well established, and so well established that in fact all these warm periods have got their own names. Uh, and it's very clear uh, that these uh, periods in here, and here, and here, the points on the graph are warmer than today. So from a whole variety of paleoclimatological evidence all over the world, there is no evidence that the late 20th century warming is in any way unusual, either in the magnitude of the peak or in the rate of warming. That is test number two of our hypothesis. Test number three is a cause and effect one in a sense. We say that increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to cause the temperature to go up. So we compare those two curves, as Fred has done five minutes ago. The red curve is the IPCC temperature curve from 1860 through to 2000. And the black curve is the ramping up of carbon dioxide. And what we see is that at precisely the time after the Second World War, that the carbon dioxide emissions are increasing at their greatest rate, the temperature goes down. So test number three, there is very little correlation between these two curves, and that cause and effect uh, just doesn't work. Little relationship exists between carbon dioxide and temperature change over the last 150 years. Test number four is this wonderful diagram, probably one of the most exciting science diagrams of the 20th century from the Vostok Ice Core, published in the early 1990s. The orange curve at the top is the um, carbon dioxide, and the red curve in the middle is the temperature. Ignore methane and blue on the bottom. And we see a very close correlation between the orange and the red curves, which led people to immediately say, aha, there's the smoking gun. We told you so. Every time the carbon dioxide goes up, the temperature goes up. Every time it goes down, the temperature goes down. The problem was that more detailed work of these peaks, and we'll look, oh, and from this came the legend that in, in the uh, glaciations, the cold periods, the uh, carbon dioxide content was about 180 parts per million, and in the warm periods, about 280. And I don't need to explain why I use the word legend, because Fred Goldberg has just explained this, that it is very unlikely that this 280 parts per million actually re represents the true interglacial value. The real value is probably significantly higher. But let's just look at the, the bit in the box here, coming into the, uh, this diagram has 400,000 years out to the right, and zero out to the left. I'm sorry about this laser pointer, it just won't work for me. And let's zoom in and look at that a little bit, which is the change from the last glaciation uh, to the uh, modern warm period. So we're going at the right-hand side of this graph 20,000 years ago, and the left-hand side 10,000 years ago. Here's the temperature warming up. Here's the start of the modern warm period, and we're out here somewhere today. This is what the geologists call the Holocene. It's the last ice age. Here's carbon dioxide increasing in parallel with the temperature. We told you so until you look in detail. And when you look in detail, you find that the change in the 
temperature precedes by between a few hundred and a thousand or so years the change in carbon dioxide. I'll say that again. Change in temperature precedes the change in carbon dioxide. This is a simple cause and effect. Our hypothesis says it's the other way around. You've never heard anybody argue that lung cancer causes smoking. <laughs> in ice cores, then, the changes in temperature precede the changes in carbon dioxide uh, by 800 to 2,000 years. At the scale of the big climatic glacial and glacial cycles, carbon dioxide does not force temperature. Our fifth and last test is the so-called fingerprint method, whereby we abandon empirical data at the beginning, we're going to use it to test, uh, but we, we start by saying, what, what is the theoretical physics of this? What, what we know about the circulation of the atmosphere, and all the physicists agree, all the atmospheric physicists agree, and these are the computer models of the IPCC, that when you plot uh, temperature against latitude, this is 75 degrees north, 75 degrees south of the equator in the middle, and against height in the atmosphere in kilometers on the right hand side, 4, 8, 12, up to 28 kilometers, that if you have greenhouse warming forced by greenhouse gases, the fingerprint you should produce is warming in the troposphere, upper troposphere in the tropics at around 10 to 12 kilometers, and also warming at the surface at the pole. This is a very clear fingerprint predicted by all the people who are studying this and summarized in this comprehensive US report a couple of years ago. Problem is, when we look at the empirical data, we find it's warming at the South Pole. We also find, and this is a paper by Fred Singer and co-authors, uh, uh, Douglas, Christie, Pearson, and Singer, 2007, we've now plotted uh, height in the at atmosphere is across the top here, uh, 246 up to 14 kilometers. So this is our height, uh, and, and this is rate of warming, with this being warming and this being cooling below the zero line. The red is the uh, average of all the models. They all predict increased rates of warming in the troposphere at heights of 8 through 12 kilometers. The actual data of different sorts and the satellite data are the uh, uh, yellow triangle and diamond. All of those fall outside the range of uh, 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 error range of the model predictions and indicate this pattern. So the empirical test of the theoretical prediction is it fails. The real world is not as it is being modeled by these greenhouse models. So that's test number five. And in summary, five tests, five failures. What the dictionary calls our provisional supposition or hypothesis that dangerous greenhouse warming does not account for the known facts. The greenhouse hypothesis is thereby possible. You think from the newspapers and television that this is a secret. <laughs> it's not a secret. It's known to thousands of scientists worldwide, including many at this meeting. 103 of them, in December last year, during the Bali meeting, wrote to the Secretary General of the United Nations. And in the letter that they wrote to him, they said, this letter details some of the serious science misrepresentations, that's a pretty heavy accusation, uh, of in the IPCC summaries for policy makers. It calls attention to the outdated nature of some IPCC conclusions, and it shows that balanced economic analyses, that's going on in another room, do not support measures to restrict energy consumption for the purpose of diminishing carbon dioxide emissions. The signatories further explain that the current UN approach of curbing carbon dioxide emissions is likely to increase human suffering uh, rather than decrease it because attempts to drastically cut carbon dioxide emissions will seriously slow development. Who wrote this stuff? Must be a bunch of cowboys. <laughs> well, the list includes two of the world's greatest living physicists, Professor Zicchici from Italy and Freeman Dyson from the United States. It, it includes winners of the Mills Medal in Cloud Physics of the Royal Meteorological Society, uh, the Chapman Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, and the Meissinger and Cheney Awards of the American Meteorological Society. Out of 103 signatories, 24 are emeritus professors. 
So, of course, this letter was on the front page of the New York Times, and the London Times, and the Australian. It received not a mention in the world press. Why not? Why does it matter? This is just an academic problem. One bunch of pointy heads are saying that global warming is happening, and another bunch saying it isn't. Well, it matters because in the last month, we have had power emergencies, first in South Africa, where the mines have shut down, had to shut down because the electricity grid failed. Secondly, in New Zealand, where the wind failed to blow and they had a power station out of commission being maintained. <clears throat> Thirdly, in the United States, you all saw it a couple of days ago, the same thing happened, the wind stopped blowing in West Texas, so we have a power crisis. And fourthly, in Europe, where the estimates are that $2 trillion worth of new energy generating resources have to be built in the near future, and the global warming alarmists will not let you build nuclear power stations and will not let you build coal-fired power stations. You might think that's a problem, but don't worry. The minister in South Africa that dealt with this first emergency has the answer for you. Go to sleep earlier so that you can grow and be cleverer. Boil less water, Use the microwave rather than the stove, take a shower, and not a shallow bath. Take a shower, indeed. <laughs> okay, important conclusions. The assumption that prior to the Industrial Revolution, the Earth had a stable climate is just simply wrong. Climates always change, it always will. There's absolutely nothing unusual about present day rates or magnitude of climate change. Atmospheric carbon dioxide is neither a pollutant nor is it the primary forcing agent of temperature change. Rather, carbon dioxide is a benefit for humankind. Try telling your teenage daughter that. <laughs> Attempting to stop climate change is an expensive act of utter futility. The only sensible thing to do about climate change is to prepare for it in both directions, both for the beneficial warmings and for the much more dangerous coolings, for both are certain to occur in the future. And finally, don't forget, oh, sorry, this is you. <laughs> really?